Well, I have told you uh, repeatedly, you should always check what I say. I want to correct something from last week. I referred to a study last week when I was talking about all the, uh, the shootings in our nation. And I mentioned that a study had shown that 26 of the 27 shooters were from fatherless homes. I had a friend send me an email this week after hearing that with a link. Um, that, that survey was from a very trusted source, but they got it wrong. Actually, um, this is what their correction, we found that maybe four or five of the 27 shooters we could definitely conclude had been raised in an intact family. So it, it wasn't 26, it was more like 23, 22. Still, as the uh, email that my friend sent me said, the, the case is made that we definitely have a problem uh, with young men in this country, and the problem is absent uh, fathers. So just wanted to offer that correction this morning. Well, last week, uh, as we're continuing to move through Acts, um, Paul gave a strong challenge to those leaders from Ephesus. You remember the first thing was they were to watch themselves, and then secondly, they were to watch over the flock uh, that God has entrusted to them. And while that was a word specifically to leaders, it's certainly a good word for all of us because we all influence people. And, and again, as I was at that gas station this week, I thought, my goodness, we do need to be careful how we live. In fact, I had another church member tell me this morning about having a similar experience of being recognized as being from this church. It's important to watch ourselves um, understand that we influence others. Well, two things that Paul uh, mentioned last week that hopefully were thought-provoking and, and spirit-stirring for you and, and me as well is that he was going to Jerusalem. Uh, he told the Ephesian elders that. He knew that difficulty awaited, and, and he answered the question that we would all ask, well, why, why would you go? Why would you step into that? When he stated, look, my life is worth nothing to me apart from Christ. I only want to finish the race. I want to finish the task uh, that God has called me to, that the Lord has given me. And you think about it, in essence, Paul was saying, if, if God chooses to send me into harm's way for the sake of the gospel, I'm fine with that. Whatever it takes for me to accomplish God's purpose, Paul was saying, I'm at his disposal. Uh, he can do with me as he wishes. And then the second thing, you remember that Paul declared he was innocent of the blood of all because he had declared the full message. He had given the warning that God had called him to give. And you remember that was a a look back to Ezekiel 33 where the watchmen in, in the cities where they were walled, the watchman was given the task of sounding the alarm. As long as he sounded the alarm, the blood of those in that city was not on him. They had to choose whether or not to respond appropriately when he sounded the alarm. But if he didn't sound the alarm, if he didn't give the warning, then the blood of those uh, who suffered was, was on his hands. Good reminders as we follow Christ, as we think about our our lives being surrendered to him, we exist for his purpose and his plan. And ultimately, his purpose and plan for all of us is to take the gospel to all men. Well, you see the title this morning of the message is Jerusalem Bound, because Paul was uh, bound for Jerusalem. He was headed to Jerusalem. We're also going to see that when he got to Jerusalem, he was bound, or Paul uh, became a prisoner. Uh, this return to Jerusalem technically is the end of the third missionary journey, but Paul is actually on a, a fourth journey. It's not often referred to as a fourth missionary journey, but he's on the fourth journey, on this final journey to Jerusalem and ultimately to Rome, which was kind of his end game. Uh, Paul is still a missionary, but he's, he's also a, a prisoner. Now, we're going to be covering a lot of ground this morning. We're going to be moving from uh, chapter 21 all the way through uh, chapter 23 and verse 11. We're going to look at two or three snapshots, but let me just kind of give you an overview um, of these chapters, 21 through 23, and you can kind of skim and, and follow as we go. When Paul leaves those Ephesian elders, you remember they had come to Miletus, he had called them to come there. When he leaves them, he goes by boat, he stops at Tyre, and the people there, of course, urge him when they know what he's facing, urge him not to go on. He goes from there to Caesarea. At Caesarea, he stays at the house of Philip the Evangelist. Interestingly, Philip was one of the seven. Philip was an associate of Stephen, whom was martyred, and Paul gave approval uh, to the martyring of Stephen, and yet he stayed at, at Philip's house. And, and there at Philip's house, uh, a prophet by the name of Agabus, you remember Agabus from Acts chapter 11, Agabus came and said that a famine was coming 
to Judea, the people of Jerusalem would be severely affected. Well, the same Agabus came there when Paul was in Caesarea, and he took uh, a belt, and Agabus bound himself with that belt and said, prophesied that when Paul got to Jerusalem, he would be bound and handed over to the Gentiles. Now, remember, the Jews were the main ones who stood against Paul, but eventually Paul would be handed over to the Gentiles, to the Romans, and that's what would, uh, would cost him his life. But Paul declares here at Caesarea, look, uh, you, you all are weeping, you all are tugging at my heart, you need to stop doing that. I'm, I'm determined, and I, I am bound to go to Jerusalem, and I'm certainly willing to be bound and to die for the cause of Christ if that's what he chooses to do. He gets on to Jerusalem, and he meets with, uh, with James. James, of course, is the head of the Jerusalem church. Meets with James and the elders. They're very excited when Paul gives a report about what's happened. All the Gentiles who are coming to Christ are very excited about that. But they have a concern, and they explain to Paul that the Jews here think that the Jews that you are reaching, Paul is reaching Jews and Gentiles, they think you're telling people to ignore the law. You remember this Jerusalem council had decided the Gentiles did not have to go through all the Jewish rituals and customs. They simply had to come to Christ by faith. Well, Paul, if you look at his teachings all through Acts, Paul did tell the Gentiles they were free not to follow the customs and rituals of Judaism, but he also told the Jews they were free to keep following the customs and rituals, but they needed to be careful they weren't placing their faith in the customs and rituals that their faith was in Christ alone. And that's, that's a great warning word for us today as well. There are many people in our culture that keep the customs or rituals, if you will, of Christianity, of, of going to church and, and doing the things that Christians do, but if they haven't come to faith in Christ, if they haven't surrendered their life to him as Savior and Lord, then they, they don't belong to him. Paul said, look, you're free to do those things as far as religion goes that you want to do, but your faith cannot be in those things. And so because of this concern, James and the elders encourage Paul. There's a certain rite of purification that's coming up, and there are four men that are going to go through this rite. They encourage Paul to go to the temple with these four men and complete this rite of purification. Paul does that, and because Paul has been seen around the city with Gentiles, you remember the leaders of all these churches that had taken the offering were coming with Paul to Jerusalem, so he'd been seen around the city with Gentiles. The accusation is made that Paul took uh, one of the Gentiles into the temple. Now, there's a sign. There's a, there's a Gentile court, the outermost court, where the Gentiles can be, but they can't go beyond that. And there's a sign there that basically said, look, if you go beyond this point, your blood is on your own head. It's going to cost you your life. Well, they're saying Paul took a Gentile into that inner court, past the court of Gentiles. Once that accusation is made, a, a, a mob scene again occurs. You remember how these mob scenes are? Half the people there don't know what's going on. They just jumped in. A mob is a body without a head. That's what a mob is. These people didn't even know what was up, but this mob scene ensues, and so Paul ends up um, being arrested by the Romans really to protect his life. There's a garrison of about 1,000 soldiers there at the temple, and they see this, hear this commotion, and they go out, and they arrest Paul and, uh, and pull him away from the crowd. In that process... Um, Paul asked the, the, the Roman commander who's in charge of that group of soldiers if he can speak to the crowd, and he's given the opportunity to do that. And as he begins to speak in Aramaic, which is their language, it kind of quiets the crowd. They listen to what he has to say as he explains the gospel to them. The problem is, at the end of this um, speech or this talk that he gives them, he mentions that God has sent him to the Gentiles. Well, at that point, the riot erupts again as the Jews hear him say that God has sent him to the Gentiles. Now, Paul has come to Jerusalem because he wants to bear witness there again, but Paul also has come to Jerusalem to deal with the most pressing issue in the church. There was a division between the far, far right legalistic Jews and the Gentiles. This struggle over the, the rituals and customs. The Jews were trying to force the Gentiles to keep certain rituals and customs when it should have been about faith alone. Well, Paul, when this, uh, this erupts with the crowd, he's taken back into custody. The, the Roman commander, Claudius Lysus, still hasn't figured out what's going on. He's trying to figure out 
what it is, what Paul has done. Is Paul a criminal? Uh, what has he caused? And he's got no answer, so Claudius calls the Sanhedrin together. And when the Sanhedrin comes, they're, they're pretty divided. The Sanhedrin split between Pharisees and Sadducees. Paul is a, is a Pharisee, so the Pharisees are for him. And, and the Sanhedrin almost physically is, is going to rip Paul to shreds just fighting back and forth. So the Roman commander has him arrested again, taken back into custody. Now think about this. Within just a week of Paul's arrival in Jerusalem, there's been a lot of upheaval um, Paul's presence has caused quite a stir in, in that city, as it did most places he went. But it really wasn't Paul, it was the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel causes a stir. The message of the gospel is offensive to many. Now, we don't have time to look at every nuance. That was a pretty fast overview of those chapters. But I want to point out two major thoughts or considerations for your personal application today. And it's really just two words about Paul. Paul's tenacity and Paul's testimony. So let's, let's look first. Let's start with Paul's tenacity. Back in chapter 19, when Paul was in Ephesus, if you look back in chapter 19, you'll read these words. He was resolved in his spirit to go to Jerusalem, and then ultimately, as I said, his end game was Rome. Jerusalem was just a, a stop or a way to get to Rome. And then in chapter 20, that we looked at last week, as Paul is saying his farewell to the Ephesian elders in chapter 20, he says this, I'm compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Now, he mentions he's been warned. The Spirit has warned him that if he goes to Jerusalem, there's going to be tremendous hardship, there's going to be suffering there, it may cost him his very life, so he knows that, but he still is compelled to go. And, and we've seen and, and I just mentioned this morning several, all along the way, the believers warned him. The Ephesians warned him, oh, you, you shouldn't go. The disciples in Tyre, Agabus, the disciples in Caesarea, even those traveling with Paul, those who were part of his team, kept warning him not to go to Jerusalem because of the warnings that the Spirit had given him. But Paul never shrinks back. He's resolved, he, he's firm, he's resolute. You know, and you see that and you start to wonder, is, is Paul missing God here? All these, all these godly people, all these godly believers warning him, and he's ignoring those warnings. Paul makes it clear his destination was to be in Jerusalem, and if you look in chapter three, 23 and verse 11, the Lord clearly affirms that. After all this disruption in Jerusalem, Paul has faced that mob scene. Paul has been arrested. Paul's addressed the mob, and it turns into a riot, and Paul's before the, the, uh, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they, they almost get violent. In, in spite of all that, chapter 23, verse 11, it says, The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Paul, you're on the right path. Your coming to Jerusalem was, was of me, and you're going to get to Rome. You're going to get to Rome, and you're going to share about me in Rome just as you have here in Jerusalem. Now, I'm not telling you Paul didn't have any fear. Clearly, the Lord came to him there in verse 11 because he needed some, some reassurance. I'm not saying he didn't have fear, but it's clear he's absolutely sure where God has called him, what God has told him to do. And there's no doubt in his mind and, and no doubt in his spirit. And as I thought this week about Paul's tenacity, as I thought about his resoluteness, you see it throughout the book of Acts. How, how was Paul so sure? How could he recognize the Spirit's voice so clearly? And then the question for us is, how can we? Is it possible for us to be that clear about the calling and the command of the Spirit in our lives? Well, as I pondered that this week, my mind was drawn to the 37th Psalm. You, you can turn there if you'd like. I'm not going to cover the entire psalm. The 37th Psalm is the Psalm of David. Obviously, it was written before Paul's time. It's an old, in the Old Testament. But I'm going to tell you, the 37th Psalm could have clearly been about Paul. It could have been a prophecy of his life. David is struggling with the fact that, that the wicked seem to prosper and excel so much, and God is encouraging him to recognize no matter what he sees in this life, while the wicked may appear to prosper, their day is coming. 
But in the, in the midst of this 37th Psalm, there's really just one verse I want to I point your attention to that I think would, would help us understand how Paul was so sure when he said he was compelled in his spirit. Psalm 37, 4. The Lord says to David, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, it's easy to see how that verse could be misinterpreted. Just you know, if, if you read some scripture every day, you have a quiet time and you pray, God's going to give you anything you want. Well, first of all, what I just described is not delighting in the Lord. D delighting in the Lord is, is much, much more than that. But I think you can get a better understanding, a correct interpretation of that verse by understanding one word in that verse, and that's the word give. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The idea here is that when you're delighting in the Lord, what does that mean? It means you're putting him first in, in everything. You want him above everything. He's the most important thing in your life. He's not just a, a priority. He's preeminent. There's nothing more important. When you are delighting in him, he gives you righteous desires. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he puts in your heart the desires he wants you to have. You could literally say he will place or he will set right desires in your heart when you're delighting in him. Here's how this verse ought to read. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will put right desires in your heart. In fact, the Hebrew word that's translated here, give, typically in the Old Testament is translated put. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will put right desires in your heart. God is going to give you everything he desires. Delight yourself in the Lord. Paul clearly, if you look at his life, delighted in the Lord. That's why he was able to say that he was resolved in his spirit because it wasn't just his desire, it was that the spirit of God had, had placed that desire in him. And I don't know about you, but I would love to have that kind of confidence in my actions. To, to know clearly when I have a desire, when I want to do something, to know clearly that God is leading me, that he has placed that desire in me, therefore he's going to fulfill it. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will put in your heart the desires he wants you to have. Paul, Paul was fully surrendered. He was delighted to serve the Lord. He was totally committed to the work of the master to the point that he said, if, it, if God chooses to put me in harm's way, if it costs me my life to serve him and to follow him, I'm fine with that. That's God's prerogative. And, and Paul's course was clear, not without difficulty, but clear, and so Paul just continued to walk in the path that was set before him. That's why he was so tenacious. That's why he was so resolved, so firm, so resolute about what was before him. Because Paul so walked with the Lord that the Lord put in his heart this desire, this compelling, this drawing to Jerusalem and then to Rome. And Paul was able to walk confidently in faith. Now, let's look at chapter 22, and we're going to read some of this together. I want you to see now Paul's testimony. Uh, since the beginning of the book of Acts, we've seen the importance of sharing the message. And certainly in these last few weeks as we've overviewed the ministry of Paul, we see Paul consistently sharing, and we understand the call to that is not just for Paul, but it's for every one of us as believers. Look with me in chapter 22. We'll jump into the first verse and read through verse 16. This is Paul's testimony. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense I now make before you. When they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet, and he said... I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, and brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was one of the most respected rabbis of their time. According to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. What is he saying? I'm, I'm just like you. I'm a Jew just like you, and I'm probably more zealous and more faithful to the, to the customs and the rituals than even you are. Verse 4, I persecuted this way, talking about believers. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. They became referred to as the way. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, Rise and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came to Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At the very hour I received my sight and saw him. Then he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to every one of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Now, not to oversimplify, but let me give you uh, the cliff notes of Paul's testimony because it's a great model for us. Here's the three basic things that Paul communicated in this, in this testimony. First of all, he says to them, I was a very religious person, a very good person, not that different from any of you. So he identifies himself with them. And then he says, God revealed to me, in spite of the fact I was a very religious person, God revealed to me that I was going the wrong way that I was a sinner, that I would never be acceptable to him on the basis of what I was doing. And then he simply says, God opened my eyes to the truth that I needed to repent and turn to him, and he called me to serve him and to share the truth with you. It's a very simple testimony. Obviously, Paul gave much more detail than that, but a very simple testimony that he shared. He identified with them. He talked about how he he was brought to the realization he was going the wrong way. He was a sinner in need of repentance, and then how God opened his eyes and how he was saved, how he came to faith, and then was used by God. This past week, I was talking with Pastor Jason about our journey through Acts, and, and the number of times we've been reminded of the responsibility of every believer to share the gospel. You know, the church is not, as a church, we're not fulfilling our purpose. And and we can't say we're evangelistic, that we're fulfilling that purpose. We can't say that if individual believers are not doing that. We, We can't just go around telling people, Garrick Springs is an evangelistic church, if we don't have individual members out sharing the truth, sharing the gospel. Being an evangelistic church is not about what happens in here on Sunday mornings or other events we do. It's about the body, each individual member of the body, doing the same thing we see Paul doing here. And you might say, well, I don't know what to do next. I don't know where to start. Well, Paul's testimony is a great model. I took, I took the outline of Paul's testimony and thought about my own, and, and here's my simple testimony based on Paul's, Paul's model. I, I was a really good person. Never really got into trouble much as, as a kid, went to church all the time, tried to live right according to what Scripture says. But you know what? As a young adult, I became very frustrated with my life. I didn't have a real sense of purpose. I, I couldn't answer the question about why I'm here and, and what I'm living for. The direction of my life just didn't seem that important. And then God really opened my eyes and ears to the message that I've heard for some time but not really listened to. I needed Christ to forgive me, and I needed to receive him not only as Savior, but also as Lord of my life. And since coming to faith in Christ and making him Lord, I have a very clear direction and and purpose for my life. I have something to live for. See, it's, it's that simple. Just as simple as Paul's, you don't have to be as wordy as Paul was, but just as simple as Paul's testimony, it's that simple of identifying with those who don't know Christ because we've all been there and explaining how God intersected our life and showed us the truth and then telling what difference that has made in our lives since we've come to faith in Christ. And you know, as I'm, as I'm able to share that with someone, hopefully they will identify and the door will be open to share further. They'll want to know what's, what's made that difference, but that doesn't happen. I don't have the opportunity to really share in depth unless I'm willing to very simply initially open my mouth and, and give testimony of what a difference Christ has made in my life. It's that simple. So when you, you've heard week after week as we've studied through Acts, when you've heard you need to be a witness, you need to be a witness, you need to be a witness, please don't think, well, I don't know how to do that. I haven't been trained in that. 
If you've come to faith in Christ and you could write three sentences, what your life was like, how God got your attention, and what your life is now like, then you have a testimony that you can share. Well, as we, as we wrap up this morning, let me, let me reiterate our two takeaways. First of all, if you've trusted Christ, when you come to Christ, when you come to faith in Christ, that means he's Savior, he forgives your sin, which you and I need because we're all sinners, but it also means he's Lord. That means he has a calling on your life. That means he has the right to interrupt your life. That means your life is not always going to be easy. That means he may even send you into difficulty in order to bring glory to God and and may send you into challenging situations to be able to share the gospel. So, so you and I, understanding that Christ is Savior and Lord, we've got to, got to walk closely. We've got to listen to his spirit. Remember, if we're not delighting in him, if we're not putting him first, not, not playing a game, saying that we do, but living life our own way, but if we're delighting in him and putting him first and really making him preeminent in our lives, then he's going to speak to our spirit by his spirit and, and tell us what we need to do. And we've got to be tenacious like Paul. We've got to be resolved to obey. We've got to be willing to pay the cost, whatever it is, in order to follow what he's told us. But then secondly, our, our, yes, our calling is to him, but remember, it's primarily to make him known to others. He hasn't just called us to himself for salvation and to, to give us a home in heaven for eternity. Yes, that's, that's a big part of it. That's why many of us come to Christ. But it's more than that. If he simply saved us to have a relation with him and be with him for all of eternity, then the moment we're saved, he should just take us home. No, he's left us here because our calling is very clear and very specific in the, in the time that we have here. It's to share the grace that we've received by faith so that others can know his grace and his love and his forgiveness as well. This morning as we, uh, as we close, I want you to think about something just for a moment. Uh, there's, there's one other little caveat in chapter 22 I want to point you to. I want you to reflect on where you are in relationship with Christ. You know, the, the big struggle between the Jews and the Gentiles was the Jews' faith was very works-oriented. They had to keep the law. They had to observe certain customs and rituals. The Gentiles simply understood that they were sinners in need of a Savior, and they came to Christ by faith alone. Well, in chapter 22... When, when this, this Roman commander, Claudius, when he arrests Paul the first time, and Paul asks to speak to the crowd, and then the crowd erupts, and Claudius takes him back into custody, Claudius is about to um, interrogate Paul, as the Romans often did, by torture, because Claudius didn't know that Paul was a Roman citizen. And Paul lets him know that. Well, in the course of that in the course of that exchange, there's this one little moment where Claudius says, you're a Roman citizen? And Claudius says, wow, I, I had to buy my citizenship. So it's a prized thing in this day to be a Roman citizen. I had to buy my citizenship, and Paul says, well, I was born into it. There's a little picture there of what it means to be saved by faith, not by works. When Claudius says he had to buy his citizenship, he had to bribe. You, you couldn't buy Roman citizenship. It was too prized and too valued. He had to bribe some officials. There were certain things he had to do to, to make that happen. And Paul says, no, I, I was born into it. I didn't have to buy it. You, you can't buy it. You understand that faith in Christ is not something you can earn or deserve. It's, it's not something you can buy. You can't buy God off by being good enough, by doing enough good, by attending church enough. You, you can't buy God off. You have to be born into it. When I say born into it, I don't mean you're born into it if you're born into a Christian family. Born into it means you're born by faith in Christ alone. There's no other way to come to faith. And that little picture is a picture that maybe someone in here needs today to recognize that you can't earn your salvation. You can't earn relation with God. There's nothing you can do that would be good enough. God says your best acts of righteousness are like filthy rags. 
You can't earn it, you can't buy it, you can't be good enough, you can't come from the right family, you can't attend the right church. You only come to faith in Christ by being born into the family through Jesus alone. There is no other way.